and coming tonight. Appreciate it. And, uh, and I'll turn it over to Alex. Thanks. All right. Do you want to use the microphone? I didn't even ask Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I'll start out with the microphone. And I do speak loudly, so if I'm too loud, let me know. All right, well, thank you guys all for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, I started out in St. Croix as a sea turtle research intern in 2013 for the Park Service. And little did I know at that moment that that would be what got me into sea turtles. So I, I am absolutely thrilled to be back here, not only doing my doctoral work, but really being able to share it with you guys this evening. We have some exciting results. Um, so like Clayton mentioned, I am a doctoral candidate at the University of Florida. Um, my research, I'm broadly interested in marine foraging ecology, and I do specialize in organisms that are highly migratory, so that really kind of linked me into sea turtles. And specifically today, I'll be talking to you about the green turtle with a talk titled, Green Turtles in Greener Pastures, the Role of Grazing in Caribbean Seagrass Ecosystems. So it's rather well established that in terrestrial ecosystems, large herbivores play a very important role in regulating the growth of plants. And this is so well studied that over the last, I'd say, 50 years, we know quite a bit of how these, green, how these uh, grazers really interact with their systems. Um, and they play a role in determining the uh, physical structure of the plant community, but also how the system functions. So really, if you were to remove these grazers, this system would look dramatically different. Now in aquatic ecosystems, as you may have guessed, we know far, far less about the role of large herbivores and, and, and in terms of how they affect plant systems. And this includes seagrass meadows. Now this lack of knowledge largely stems from the fact that seagrass meadows today support very low populations of large herbivores. And this includes green turtles. Uh, green turtles have been heavily overexploited over the last 200 years worldwide, and it's usually for their meat. In the Caribbean alone, it's thought that their populations have been reduced by 97% from when Columbus originally landed in the Cayman Islands. So when we think about seagrass meadows today, what I think most of us envision is something like this, you know, a really dense meadow, like really long blades. This is an ungrazed seagrass system. Now, that rightfully so, since this is what we see, or have been used to seeing for the last several hundred years, most scientific studies and our knowledge of what these ecosystems provide humans are based in ungrazed meadows. But prior to Columbus landing in the Caribbean, it's likely these systems look very different when there are a lot of green turtles around. It's also quite likely those systems functioned differently. And this is really where my dissertation work comes in. Fortunately for us, we might actually be able to see what a seagrass system with lots of green turtles looks like. And this is because Green turtle populations are recovering, particularly in the Caribbean, and it's been showing an upward trajectory over the last 20, so, 20 or so years. Now, what this is doing is it's transitioning a lot of these seagrass systems back to a naturally grazed state. Now, you guys can readily see, I'm sure, in this photo of the effect that grazing has on this system in that it dramatically reduces or changes the structure, um, and rightfully so, it would probably change the function as well. Naturally, though, while green turtle populations are recovering, unfortunately, seagrass meadows are rapidly declining. And this is worldwide. And it's largely due to anthropogenic effects, especially nutrient runoff from erosion and coastline development. So we now have this question, with green turtles recovering, is high-intensity grazing even sustainable? Now, why should we care about this? Well, obviously, I mean, we've been very passionate about conserving these animals. We want to see them, you know, stick around. But also, these seagrass meadows, while they're not as charismatic as reef systems, they provide so much for human populations. And this, you know, goes into coastline buffering from storms. Um, it provides nursery habitat for a huge amount of commercial fishery species. And also, it provides forage for several different types of animals and habitat. So that's really. In order for us to understand the effects of recovery of green turtles, we need to answer the simple question of how do green turtles even interact with these seagrass habitats? And so that's going to go into how we answer, is high intensity grazing sustainable and what we have to offer turtles today? So this is where my doctoral research comes in. And I like to think of it as having two parts. First, what is the effect of grazing on seagrasses? And I'm particularly interested in how green turtle grazing affects growth of the plant. 
So as you can see where I'm going with this, it's really based on what we do in land-based systems, right? Like I, I can envision doing this on a cattle ranch somewhere actually, just using different animals. Then I want to flip this question around. How do seagrass pastures then affect green turtle behavior? And by behavior, I mean how do we know where they decide to eat? That's a pretty important question to answer in terms of management. But also, how do these pastures affect how much the turtle actually eats, so their intake? And so I'm going to break it down today, and I'm going to talk a little bit about part one first, and then I'll get into part two. So like I said, we know in terrestrial systems that green turtles play, or sorry, that uh, uh, large herbivores play an important role in regulating growth of plants. But we have not explored this in seagrass ecosystems, especially for large herbivores. Now, what we see here is actually an ungrazed meadow from Buck Island. Um, this species of seagrass here is known as turtle grass. Um, I'll refer to it as Thalassia testudinum because that's honestly what I'm the most familiar with calling it. And <laughs> I know it's silly, like yeah, I should say turtle grass. Um, but I want you to know that at Buck Island, as well as throughout the Caribbean in general, this is the dominant seagrass species, and it's also naturally the preferred forage for green turtles. So the regulating mechanisms, or basically the things that drive growth of thalassia, are well studied. And these things include temperature, or water temperature, as well as seasonality, uh, light access, that's pretty important for these plants as well, uh, water depth, as well as nutrient limitation, particularly in the sediment. But what about grazing? Does grazing by green turtles also drive seagrass production? So like I mentioned, green turtles are large marine herbivores. And even at low population levels, they are still the primary consumers of seagrasses worldwide. Now, C Caribbean green turtles in particular, they have a unique grazing strategy in which they'll actually select and repeatedly crop distinct areas of seagrass. So they're almost like damselfish in a way, like they'll cultivate these little gardens. Um, now what this does is it actually increases the nutrient content of the grass, so the turtle gets more bang for their buck over time in terms of nutrients. And we know through experiments that this type of recropping of grass should stimulate growth. However, again, those are just using simulated grazing experiments. But studies done in naturally grazed meadows that turtles actually use are extremely limited, and they have focused entirely in just shallow foraging areas. Now, given that we know these animals are using shallow seagrass beds, deeper seagrass beds, we really need to understand how grazing affects seagrass growth, not just in shallow meadows, but over a gradient of different depths and habitats. So for this part of my study, we basically outlined two fairly simple questions. First, is there a difference in seagrass growth between an ungrazed meadow and a naturally grazed meadow? And second, since we know what drives growth in ungrazed meadows, which included temperature and light, what regulates productivity in meadows that are grazed by turtles? So Buck Island Reef National Monument is actually a wonderful place to start, to start exploring the role of high intensity grazing in seagrass systems. And this is a great opportunity because seagrass meadows at Buck Island, they're dispersed over a wide variety of habitats. You've got sh excuse me, shallow meadows, um, you've got these intermediate depth meadows, and you've got deeper meadows. And given Park Service data, as well as some of the data from USGS turtle researchers, we know that these turtles are using these environments, and quite heavily. Um, the other thing about Buck Island is it also supports a recovering green turtle population. And similar to the, uh, most of the Caribbean, has been showing an upward trajectory of their population over the last 15 or so years. So it's really quite exciting to conduct a study like this at Buck Island. All right, so how did we measure seagrass growth? Well, um, we took these herbivore exclosures here, uh, which are basically just fancy little cages I made out of PVC pipe and chicken wire, um, and I put them in grazed meadows and in ungrazed meadows. And this was simply just to keep turtles from grazing in a certain spot for a period of time so I could measure the growth of the blades. Now, over the course of the study, I deployed 129 exclosures um, for about seven to 10 day periods during July through October 2017 and January through February 2018. 
Now, many of you may be familiar, this actually corresponds to um, the seasonal temperature change here um, with the summer associated with this period and the winter associated there. And in the course of this study, we saw about a three degree change in water temperature in Celsius. Now, we measured seagrass growth using four different ways. Um, the first, we measured the vertical growth in blade length, pretty simple. We also measured the change in blade area because we weren't sure if the turtles would maybe also have an effect on how, um, how wide the blades were. Uh, we also measured um, the actual mass of blades produced per day. And then biomass turnover, um, which basically what this is is the ratio of growth to the mass of blades that is already there. Um, I, I realize that can, maybe seems not that intuitive of why would you measure that, but basically what this tells you is how productive a system is and how quickly those nutrients or that biomass has been cycled through the system. And it's a common measurement used in terrestrial as well as aquatic systems. And I'll be focusing mostly on that growth measure today. So in, in addition to um, the growth measurements, I also collected several biological variables in order to just characterize the seagrass meadow and calculate the growth of thalassia. And this included the mass of just above ground blade tissue, the number of shoots per square meter, the length and the width of blades, the number of blades for a single shoot, and of course the nutrient content of blade tissue, because we thought that may also affect where turtles were grazing as well. As you can see, you can imagine what it might have been like sticking your face in seagrass for several hours, literally counting every single shoot. My, my field techs, I think, hated me at certain times, but it's exciting where this data has gotten us. All right, so back to the first question. Simply put, is there a difference in seagrass growth between grazed meadows and ungrazed meadows? Now I'm gonna present this to you just with a chart here. Um, here is just the measure of growth. And then I have the two depth habitats at Buck Island, and this wasn't necessarily predetermined by me. Um, this is just where the turtles happened to graze. At around the, um, I'd say, 20-foot range, there wasn't a lot of grazing. Um, I'm not really sure why, but they seem to really work in shallow meadows and then kind of the deeper meadows out of Buck. Um, I also want you to note that we prioritized seasonal measurements for deep meadows, just given there is no data out there on seagrass growth especially Thalassia, past the depth of six meters. So this is not only a, a really cool opportunity just to look at ungrazed meadows, but there, there's no work out there that can tell us really how green turtles are affecting these deeper meadows. All right, so when I have the data come up here, just note that G is gonna correspond to grazed meadows and U to ungrazed meadows. Now what we find here just for shallow meadows is pretty consistent with some of the previous studies in that grazing significantly elevates blade linear and blade area growth, as well as biomass turnover. Now remember, biomass turnover is, can also be reflective of how quickly those nutrients are cycling through the system. So grazing is actually stimulating that, which is pretty cool. Now mass growth, on the other hand, is lower in grazed meadows, and this is usually due to there being fewer blades per shoot. What tends to happen to grass when it's grazed is it does get a little bit stressed, so it funnels energy into growing up, not necessarily growing several blades for a single shoot. It's just how they allocate energy. Now what's neat here is once you add the data in from the deep meadows, is that relationship is pretty much consistent across the board. So then we ask, okay, well is this really the whole story here? Obviously grazing stimulates growth, but what we need to account for is not only how seagrass just differs between shallow and deep meadows, and that's just, honestly, I think it's based on how much light it's able to get. So not only does the seagrass differ by habitat, but the turtles are very evidently using these areas differently. So this is why we can't just look at the grazing effects in terms of a meadow as being grazed versus ungrazed. We need to take into account grazing intensity. So really, how much are those turtles using that system? And that brings us to our second question. Given that there is a difference in productivity between grazed and ungrazed meadows, then what is regulating that growth? And is grazing playing a role? So to address this question, we collected several environmental conditions in addition to like those seagrass characteristics I mentioned earlier. 
And these included naturally the water temperature, the amount of light that was available for the grass, depth naturally, and also nutrient limitation. We also, for the study, developed the first measure of grazing intensity for green turtles. And basically what I want you to take away from this is this allowed us to account for differences in the seagrass habitat between shallow and deep meadows, but also how recently a turtle may have grazed that meadow. And that plays a pretty important role in terms of how productive a system is. So first, in order to determine really what's driving productivity in these grazed meadows, we simply just wanted to see is grazing even having an effect on growth? And what we find here um, are, I should have actually mentioned this earlier, um, your closed points or your blue points are from deep meadows, and your open points are from shallow meadows. Now what this shows us is that grazing, especially at high intensity, stimulates growth. It also, and it stimulates turnover, which also means it's cycling those nutrients through the system faster. Now, what really struck us when we saw this figure is one, there's a lot of variability in those shallow meadows. Why? There's also, it appears, basically two levels of grazing intensity, kind of lower levels here in the deep meadows, and um, it seems like higher intensity grazing in the shallow meadows. So what this tells us is that not only is the grass responding to grazing differently between shallow and deep meadows, but what is regulating growth is probably different as well. Now in terms of sustainability, that's really important to take into account. So what we realized with this is in order to evaluate how grazing is regulating productivity, we not only need to account for grazing intensity, but we need to account for temperature, for light, depth, all those environmental conditions as well. And like I said, these are well established. These are known to really regulate seagrass growth. So now we're just adding in as grazing also one of those regulating factors. Now, I, really what I want you to take home from this is we just used a model that we, in order to evaluate collectively the effects of all those environmental characteristics and grazing intensity on the productivity of the grass. And if anyone's interested in how I went about doing this, I'm more than happy to speak to you afterwards. Um, so this here, again, really what I want you to take home from this, um, we have temperature and all those environmental variables here and grazing intensity here. The numbers that are in red mean they had a significant effect on growth. And what we see here is grazing intensity is definitely significant. Um, now what struck us again by these results is if you were to do this for an ungrazed meadow, temperature and light play a huge role in determining growth of those meadows. So why then, when a meadow is grazed, why are these no longer significant? And so that really struck us in that this may be playing an extremely important role in determining the productivity of the system. So just focusing on those two significant um, factors more closely, we have grazing intensity here and depth over here. But just focusing on the plot on the left, we just have biomass turnover here, grazing intensity here, and all of these little marks, all this means is it's just a single measurement from one of my cages and the intensity of grazing within. Now what we see here is even at really high grazing intensity, we have a stimulated growth value. Now to put this in perspective, I realize these values here for grazing intensity, you know, what was 0.7 mean? A value of one would mean 100% of all seagrass tissue is gone. That, that would be pretty intense for a turtle to be grazing that hard. But even a value of 0.7 is still fairly high on that scale. And what that's telling us is even at high intensities, growth of the grass is still stimulated. These high intensity grazers aren't causing a decline in these seagrass meadows. And that has been an issue through, you know, especially with the recovery of green turtles, it's thought that, oh, all well, these turtles are gonna come back, they're gonna overgraze the system, they're gonna wipe it out. But what we see here at Buck Island is that even with high intensity grazing, and especially in the plots out at Buck, those turtles have been grazing those areas for at least two years, which is a long time for a plant to support that. So the fact that we're still seeing that high growth value, it means these seagrasses can actually sustain these grazing by these animals. Now, just what I want you to take home from this is what we found was shallow meadows 
for whatever reason, seem to have higher growth than the deep meadows. And they're also tend to be more intensively grazed. So with these results from this part one, we arrived at the following. First, grazing stimulates growth of seagrasses. And this is a really exciting thing, given that, uh, honestly, a pretty negative view of green turtle recovery it, you know, it's, has been adapted um, what, uh, in crowds of at least like seagrass researchers, anybody who sees seagrass as an important climate change mitigation strategy. There's been a lot of concern that these green turtles would just wipe them out or wipe the seagrasses out. So it's exciting to see this result. Um, we also found that grazing intensity is, plays a really important role in determining how productive that system is and how quickly that those nutrients cycle through the system. Um, also, like I mentioned on the previous slide, the results we're seeing with the high intensity grazing that occurs at Buck Island, that's suggesting that high intensity grazing by recovering populations is sustainable, not only at Buck, but throughout the Caribbean. And finally, really where this is going, bigger picture, is this is gonna help us determine the carrying capacity of the system. And basically what that is, is how many turtles can these systems support? And in order to do this, you need really good data on just simple growth rates of the grass. And I know that sounds like less exciting than some more turtle-focused work, but it's really hard to protect an animal unless you know the effects on their system. And so th this part one we're really excited about. We got some pretty, um, not necessarily expected results, but given how intensely those meadows are grazed, it's awesome to see that it's actually making the system healthier and more productive. So now I'm gonna flip it around to part two. And this is honestly, uh, I mean, I love both aspects of my project, but this one's my passion. <laughs> um, this is where my video footage comes in. Um, so I'm gonna ch change the question around. How are the pasture characteristics affecting behavior? So I want you to picture a cow in a field or a goat, or if you have any sort of grazers um, at home. When they go around and you're watching them graze, do you think they're just eating everything in sight? Or do you think they're really selecting certain areas? Like you may notice like they select one area, maybe the grass isn't as thick, maybe it's not as tall. Those are for reasons related to how much they're able to eat and how much nutrients they're able to get. So I'm wanting to apply this basically to a green turtle of can we see similar patterns in this system? So what we know already about green turtle behavior is that um, usually daily they'll transit between, they'll usually have a resting area on a coral reef where they'll sleep and then they'll cycle through and migrate to their foraging area and then at night they'll return to their reef. Um, what we also know, and again this isn't you know, universal across all turtles, but most turtles will have two grazing bouts in a single day. They'll usually graze once in the morning and then they'll graze once in the afternoon. But what we don't know, aside from this behavior, is what is determining where they eat, how long they eat, and how much they eat. And that may seem like a simple question, but it's pretty hard to determine the sustainability of grazing and how many turtles these systems can support if we don't know how much they're eating. So this is where this part comes in. Um, so we outlined two questions. One simply, does the characteristics of the seagrass affect behavior? And what, is, what I mean by that is like, um, does blade length or shoot density or nutrient content of the blades affect behavior like intake? But also, do these pasture characteristics determine where they forage? So similar to like your cow in, or your goat in a pasture, what's determining why they pick one spot over another? So I do have to confess, I don't have results from this yet, and this is largely due to I collected a ridiculous amount of video footage, and I'm still going through it. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about what we did and share some of the exciting footage um, I got and how we're collecting data from it. Um, so what we did is we basically took high-definition video cameras, which is just a fancy word for a bunch of GoPros, and we stuck them underwater. <laughs> So you may have recalled in the, um, a previous photo from the beginning of the talk where I showed a graze, or a graze meadow and an ungrazed meadow. Graze meadows are pretty easy to find. They're usually cropped way down. Um, they're not these long, really lush meadows. So we'd lo locate these grazing plots and we'd set up cinder blocks with GoPros, usually down the middle, just depending on how, how the plot was shaped. And we'd deploy these cameras during the morning hours. Now the reason why we did that is from a previous project I did, 
um, using this method is we determine turtles forage more often in the morning than the afternoon. So we figured if we're gonna set up a bunch of cameras underwater, we should probably do it at a time when we know turtles are most active. So at Buck Island, based on visual surveys, those turtles are eating a lot. Like usually right after the sun comes up till about 10.30 in the morning, and then you'll see them kind of disappear and go back to the reef. Um, not to say there aren't some you know, individuals that hang around and chow down all day, but the bulk of the turtles appear to have a peak foraging hour in that time frame. Now, um, what I can share with you is the ridiculous amount of footage that we collected. We had 588 hours of high definition video footage. This is over 17 days, and remember I had 12 cameras um, each deployment day, so that's really where a lot of it came from. And I am very excited about this. We had 589 turtles grazing, or instances where they grazed in front of the camera. This is also why I'm still working on getting the data from that video footage. All right, so I won't go super into this, um, but to complement the video footage, we also naturally needed to characterize the seagrass where we set up the cameras to determine if any of these things are maybe affecting, you know, how much a turtle is eating, how much it spends looking for food, etc. cetera. Um, and one thing that at least I'm noticing in the data so far, I mean, I can't show it yet, is it appears blade length and shoot density really determine where a turtle kind of plops down and grazes. Um, and I really think the reason why is that affects how much they can physically fit in their mouth <laughs> at one time. Um, so if you've got a really dense meadow with really long blades, I mean, theoretically, yeah, they can fit more in their mouth, but then this is where nutrient content comes in. Really long blades are lower in nutrients, and they actually have to work harder to process and chew those blades. So that, that's just some exciting stuff I can't show yet, but I think that's what's going on of how they're selecting certain types of meadows over others. So now some of the cool stuff. Um, I then use this video footage to extract behavior data. Now the main things I'm interested in are these. First, I want to know their bite rate. So I literally count the number of bites per minute that turtle takes. Um, and some turtles, I mean, maybe they'll come in like this guy and only take a couple. Some turtles will stick around and take uh, almost 100 bites before going up and taking a breath. So it's really pretty variable um, what they're getting. Um, I also measure the bite size. And I know it's kind of, this footage looks a little dark in here, but I'm able to use a computer program to measure the size of the blade that the turtle bites to actually get a pretty decent estimate of bite size. Using this, I can then determine um, their intake, or, and I can then extrapolate out to how much that turtle is consuming per day, which is pretty exciting in terms of evaluating uh, carry capacity. And naturally, I also note turtle size. I mean, a juvenile turtle is probably not going to eat as much as a larger turtle. And it's cool at Buck Island because we're able to actually see juvenile turtles graze all the way up to males and nesting females. Um, so we also collected a couple of other things, um, and this was mainly due to these, honestly. For me to get that, that turtle has to be oriented pretty perfectly in front of the camera, can't be too far away. So we wanted to collect these things just in case to really kind of help us determine um, if those pasture characteristics were affecting their behavior. So just to break these down, I mean, we noted how long a turtle grazes for, um, how long they spend searching, for the spot that they graze, that can really be a determinant of, you know, is maybe there not a lot of thalassia there? Is it not very dense? And so they have to spend a lot of time finding it. Um, we also know how long it takes them to handle the food. Um, I'll show an example in a minute. I want you guys to kind of look at, see if you can see that turtle processing that food. And you may notice a short blade versus a long blade of how that affects the turtle being able to eat it. Um, we also noted a couple of other of these things, just are they disturbing the sediment? And also, fortunately, I did not expect to get this, but we're gonna be able to look at the presence of predators on the behavior of these turtles. And I'll show an example of that in a minute. Um, so this is a clip I showed you earlier. Um, now knowing what I'm collecting from this footage, I want you guys to notice just how they're biting, how long you think they spend chewing, versus actually looking around trying to, trying to find food. And also, although not exciting, 
Note how the grass changes from this clip to the next clip with the juvenile turtle. Now this turtle is chowing down. Like th those blades are pretty short. It's able to get a lot in its mouth before it starts actually chewing. Yeah, see there, now it's starting. This guy is in a meadow with a lot of longer blades. And what he comes in and he takes a few bites, but you'll notice he's honestly pretty messy at chewing his food. Um, these blades are flying all over the place. You'll see it closer once he gets here. Yeah, I mean, he's still got a blade hanging out of his mouth, so he's probably going to need to spend more time actually processing that before he can eat it. And that is gonna actually reduce how much he's able to eat over time. So that's where I'm thinking those meadows with those shorter blades and less dense actually increases the amount the turtle is able to get. Now, this is something I was not expecting to see. <laughs> Um, this was a tiger shark that showed up in our video footage for five days in a row. Um, she was definitely hunting turtles. I, um, and you could actually see her, like this is again a big grazing plot right here. You could see her in some of the clips actually just patrolling the border of the plot. You knew she was just waiting for those turtles to come around. Um, so I'm excited to say that now after I've looked at the data a little bit, I think I can actually show that the presence of a shark is going to affect where a turtle eats and you know, basically it's grazing behavior. So you can think of it in terms of like a, a lion in a savanna. You know those National Geographic clips where you have all these impala grazing and you see a lion just kind of walk through the middle of the herd and everybody just kind of steps back. The one thing those impala aren't doing when that lion is around is eating. And so I want to apply some similar, um, some similar philosophies to this shark being around. And I'll show some more clips in a minute of that. So finishing up here, we ran these two parts of the study. So what does this really mean in terms of management and for Buck Island? Well, for Buck Island, simply put, one of the goals of the Park Service is knowing their green turtle population is increasing. They wanted to know how, how many turtles can this park support. So this is where this project will be able to estimate the carrying capacity. But even more broadly, this is going to go into estimating the carrying capacity for the Caribbean, um, which is pretty exciting. And I'm hoping to get that information out there before managers in some areas start making the decision to cull turtles. Because um, there, there's a lot of turtles out there. And unfortunately, like I mentioned, it, there's some pretty negative views on how they're um, really affecting the system. Um, but what me and also my advisor don't want to happen is to start culling these turtles when we don't know if they're really actually causing harm to the system. And in the case of Buck Island, I firmly believe they're not harming the system. If anything, they're making it healthier. Um, second, uh, just establish a baseline of the seagrasses out there, but also how productive and healthy they are. Um, also, like I just mentioned, um, provide some support that high intensity grazing does appear to be sustainable. Again, I'm sure this is to a point, but given the number of turtles out there and how intensely they're grazing, I think it would take quite a few more turtles for us to even start seeing negative effects. And finally, very applicable to the Virgin Islands, we would then be able to evaluate the effects of the invasive seagrass moving in, which unfortunately, um, two years ago, right at the beginning of the study, we did find the invasive out at Buck, very in the beginning of the invasion, but that's why it was important to really do this study. So now we can really know that the effect that that invasive may have, not only on the seagrasses, but also the turtles. Um, and so to end this, um, I really, th this project could not have been done without a lot of support um, and some fantastic assistance. Um, I sincerely uh, thank the Park Service staff and the collaborators for their support during the project. This project was going on when Hurricane Irma and Maria hit. Um, there, there was a point where I thought the project was over, um, but we were very fortunate in that we were able to get back out there and keep collecting data. And um, I didn't notice any sort of effects of the hurricane on the actual productivity of the grass. So that really shows just how resilient um, those systems are. I also really need to thank these two people. Ashley Mead and Laura Palma were my two field assistants for yeah, over eight months, um, they went through the hurricane, they counted thousands of blades of grass, they dealt with large tiger sharks being around in their field site, but still, you know, jumped in the water to go do some work. Um, and really just their enthusiasm was beyond this. I mean, that, they're, they're, not, they're not field assistants anymore. We're really, really good friends now. Um, so I, I could not have done it without them. 
And then absolutely I need to thank the Archie Carr Center, which is my lab. My advisors were wonderful. My lab mate came down once to help me a little bit and you know collect some data. And of course, to thank all the um, funding sources. Um, really, this, this project was a big one and uh, couldn't have done it without that support. All right, thank you guys. I'll take any questions. Yeah, so that is a great question. And in terms of um, seagrasses, it's very hard to parse out the effects of the two, which is why you always have to measure both. Um, what I think of Buck Island, eh, there is honestly not that much difference in light between shallow and deep meadows. That wouldn't be the case everywhere necessarily. Usually deeper meadows are gonna have less light naturally. Um, so to be honest, I don't have a great answer for you because really, I mean, in the studies I've read, it's hard to know what effects are due to each one. Um, I do think there's some other things going on like deep meadows are usually, even if they have similar amounts of light as shallow, they usually have lower nutrients. Um, so that grass is already gonna be under some different constraints than a shallow meadow would. Um, so yeah, I wish I could answer that question for you. I, I'm hoping seagrass biologists are able to figure that out. Could you just tell us a little bit about what sort of technology you use to measure uh, light? Yeah, um, so I use Hobo data loggers in this sense. Um, yeah, the, and I use the small uh, 64 gigabyte ones and they measured temperature and light as well. Um, they were fine for this study, but I recommend if you need really, really accurate light values um, and you're doing it over a long period, um, I would try and bump it up to one of the, I think it's LICOR, I think LICOR, there's a different instrument you can use to get highly accurate. Um, so just consider that if you want to use similar methods. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. How long does it take the uh, seagrass, the, the, the lower meadows, to grow back? I mean, you know, animals go, I, I don't want, they certainly don't move in herds, but mm -hmm. there's a population that, that you say they seek out the same place and come back. So how long does it take when they've grazed heavily and, uh, you know, for it to start to grow? Yeah, so these meadows out here, because the water is very clear and they're not as nutrient limited, that grass could grow about three centimeters, honestly, and like, day and a half, two days, and that's about the perfect bite size for a turtle. So what I think the turtles are doing is they don't necessarily come back to the same spot every day. I think they rotate, kind of like you know a cow would or something. Um, and I honestly think that just based on the video footage of I'd put those cameras out in one plot for a week, I'd get a bunch of turtles one day, none the next. Then maybe a few on the third day, and then none the next, so. Do you, do you, have you seen any uh, shallow meadows becoming deeper meadows? <clears throat> I haven't seen that at Buck Island. Um, I do know globally that that's something um, scientists are concerned about just with sea level rise mm -hmm. is some of these shallow meadows may become deeper. Yeah. Um, but it depends on the type of seagrass. Some of the seagrass can really adapt to that pretty quickly. Um, I don't think the Lassia though, just given it's a really, it, it's kind of like the equivalent to an old growth sort of tree. Like it's, it, it, it takes a while for them to move and expand their meadows. So I think the Lassia may have a little trouble with rapid sea level rise. Um, but a, again, I, we haven't really seen too many effects of that yet, but uh, it, it's something we, we need to really like need. Just like pruning any plant yeah. makes it stronger. So I mean, yeah. So grazing could help. Yeah. yeah, and that's not what my lab really thinks is that this grazing is actually making these systems more resilient. It's increasing the growth, it's increasing the nutrient cycling, and it, it really is, it's like pruning. Um, yeah. When you say increasing the growth, you mean more dense in the same meadow, or the meadow is expanding? I mean the growth rate of the grass is higher. Um, the meadows are get larger when they're replaced? That's a great question. We haven't looked at that yet. Um, 
generally speaking, seagrass meadows like this to actually expand into, let's say, an area of bare sand, it, it takes a while. Especially for Thalassia, it could take anywhere from 40 to 50 years to expand into you know, a sandy area. Um, and that's why, like, anchor scarring, it has such a horrible effect on these grasses because a simple scar could take 50 years for that grass to grow back into. Um, but again, it really just depends on the type of grass. There's some grass that would grow back in like a month. Um, so. Yes? I know you're a seagrass person, but did it matter in your study whether the turtles were Hawkeye turtles or were just moving through? That's another really good question. Um, unfortunately, I had no way of telling of whether a turtle was you know, a resident that grazed there regularly or if it was just an individual moving through the area. Um, we do know at Buck Island, though, that at least the larger females, um, the nesting females, unique to Buck Island, they actually stick around in their foraging areas after nesting. So I'm thinking a lot of those adults actually um, stick around and graze. The males, though, I think move through. And that's just because usually males, the, they'll move into an area when there's a bunch of females around for nesting season, and then they typically leave. Um, so I think it depends on the sex of the turtle, um, also a little on the size as well. So, yeah. You mentioned that um, seagrass meadows provide the service of um, nursery for fish. Do you think that grazed meadows might change that? Or is anyone looking into? That's a fantastic question. Actually, my lab mate is her whole dissertation is going to be on how grazing affects fish communities. And she's measuring that in terms of the diversity of fish between grazed habitats and ungrazed. She's also looking at edges of grazed versus ungrazed in terms of what she finds there. Um, so yeah, great question. Uh, I'll, I'll let you know. I'll give her another three, four years to finish her study. <laughs> yeah, in the back. For the hazard of gas, why would you why do you think the turtles tend to elect to graze deep or shallow, not in the middle? Oh, yeah. Um, so I think part of that is the size of the turtle. Um, shallow, tur or, sorry, not shallow. Uh, small turtles are mo more prone to predation, um, and they tend to use shallower areas because they're not as susceptible to you know big sharks. Where bigger turtles, once they get past a certain size, they don't have to worry about predation as much, and so. What are at least the satellite tracking data that the Park Service has has shown that it's mostly the adults using those deep meadows. Um, so I would guess to say it has something to do with predator, predators. Um, and also just the older, like bigger turtles, they're able to digest different types of grasses more efficiently. So where those smaller turtles, they really need to be grazing on short, really high nutrient stuff. So I think that kind of constrains them to shallow meadows in a sense. Um, that, that's just my guess, but I really think uh, predators are a big factor, especially at Buck Island, which we're fortunate to have predators. So, <laughs> so, so the predators are not a problem for you? No, not us physically in the water. We never saw them, um, but we did timestamp the video and we knew we were deploying cages. So the and, not a oh, I never saw one. Yeah, I honestly, I mean, you can talk to Clayton, I mean, who's been in that water way more than me, and he's still never seen a tiger shark. But they're there, and I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it knew we were there, too. <laughs> yeah. What's the coolest thing you saw besides the sea turtles and the sharks? Oh, in the video footage or just while we were in the water? Um, there was one clip where we saw an octopus getting eaten by a scorpion fish. That was pretty cool to see. Um, just in general, there were a lot of fish that were pretty, like, I may I dare say, animated when they saw the camera. I mean, they, I got so much coming and checking out the cameras. I mean, you just, like, it, it, it's hard to actually pick because you, you see, once you stick that camera out and you get out of the water and then they realize humans aren't there anymore, the, those seagrass meadows are so active. There's so much going on. Um, but yeah, I'd say the scorpion fish and octopus were a highlight. We got dolphins at one point checking them out. Um, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll keep watching the videos and I'll let you know if I find something else. Yeah. Oh, we saw a hammerhead. I forgot about that. We did see a hammerhead. <laughs> yes, actually, I'm forgetting. I, I have kind of a montage of videos of other stuff I saw. 
Um, let me just. So I'll hop in and add right now that um, some of the questions that were asked about uh, the presence of turtles and how long they've been here and how we know their movements. So this is a great project in that it uh, has some overlap with some of the other collaborations and partnerships that we have. So if anyone's been here for the acoustic array uh, presentation that we had, we were actually tagging uh, sea turtles, sharks, all kinds of reef fish, and we have this passive acoustic array that's out there uh, kind of listening to see uh, when and where these animals go. And so using that data in combination with this, we can really start to, to identify, oh yeah, there was a shark right over there in that, in that meadow around the same time we were there. And we can look at um, the frequency and duration of interactions between uh, predators and prey. Uh, and we also have in-water studies uh, where we're going out on a routine basis each year and capturing um, small juvenile turtles and measuring their growth. And so we're actually able to look at and, and um, revisit and capture these individuals on an annual basis, biannual basis sometimes, and measure their growth rates. So when you incorporate these feeding rates and the bite size and all these elements, you're actually getting a really detailed story about what that um, creates in terms of biomass in that turtle. You know, a, a turtle that has a specific bite rate or feeds a uh, at an estimated uh, rate, we can translate that into an actual physical number. And so it's, it's really cool to see how these uh, projects are lining up and, and kind of um, uh, providing like a, a synergy. We're, we're getting more out of these projects together than, than uh, we would. Yeah, it's building a really cool story. I mean, I, I like to think of what I'm doing as more on just a fine scale. I mean, almost literally in, in terms of meadow, where some of these movement studies are looking at a broader scale. And combining the two together is really building a neat story of how are these animals moving in their habitat, but then why are they using certain areas over others? Um, and so in terms of management, I think that's pretty neat. The, once you start really getting that storyline. Um, so I do, again, I, I have to thank the collaborators, um, particularly Kristen Hart from USGS. Um, she is going to let me use some of her lavage data, her, her stomach contents of the turtles that she captured. Um, so I can actually look at diet as well as measure the sizes of the blades that those turtles are eating and compare that to what I'm getting in this video footage. And that group's actually out here uh, for the next couple weeks, so you might see them if you take a trip out to the they'll, they'll be out there. Do they eat any other kind of grass besides Alaska? Yeah, they definitely do. Um, it just depends on where they're at. Um, in the Caribbean in general, they're going to eat predominantly turtle grass, but they'll also eat that uh, syringodium or the manatee grass. Um, they also like uh, halidui, the common, I think that's a uh, shoal grass. They, they really like shoal grass, um, particularly the smaller turtles. And I think it's because it's easier to digest than the thalassia. So as a turtle grows, it develops um, a certain microbiome in their intestines that makes it more efficient for them to break down the thalassia. So. Yeah. I know there's nothing else as big as the turtle that eats that kind of grass, but is there anything else that eats that kind of grass? Yeah. Um, certain parrotfish will, but the difference between parrotfish versus green turtles is the amount they're able to consume. So while some parrotfish will consume the grass as well as other, um, I'm forgetting the word for it, uh, little guys that live on the blades, um, they, they're just, they're not consuming as much of it. Um, historically, uh, manatee and dugong um, consumed a lot of seagrass, not necessarily turtle grass, but they, they were other or the two other big herbivores that could eat a lot of it. Um, but it's mainly the green turtle that they've just decided, you know, several thousand years ago that that's what they were going to eat. So what about the other turtles? Only, only a green turtle? Yeah, so other sea turtle species, they're going to be more omnivorous or carnivorous. So, I mean, um, like loggerheads, for example, are going to eat a lot of like mollusks and shellfish. Um, hawksbills, I mean, I know Clay can chime in on this, they're going to eat like sponges. Um, leatherbacks will eat jellyfish. And it, it's not to say that a green turtle won't eat those things elsewhere. It's actually mainly in the Caribbean that they eat mostly grass. But if you go to Australia or something, they're going to be eating grass and jellyfish. Um, and part of that is they think just the grasses over there aren't as nutritious as what we got here in the Caribbean. 
Um, so it really just depends on where you're at. But generally speaking, green turtles are the only herbivorous sea turtle. All right. I was just going to show this one clip. I mean, so you saw part of it already. We were fortunate to get a lot of males coming through. Um, as I'm sure Clay can kind of chime in on this, uh, in terms of sea tur turtle data in general, we don't know that much about males. Um, so we were thrilled to get so many male sightings in this footage. So let me just press play here. So this is just more footage of that shark um, to give you an idea of how big it was. It was at least 10 to 11 feet based on my little computer program. Here is the hammerhead. Um, this wasn't as big. As I think I would say like eight, eight feet or so. Um, compared to the tiger shark, this was small. Um, but it was neat to get this one day. This was toward the end of the field season. Oop, there's supposed to be more after that. Hey, so we're really excited about that. We've been out um, with some researchers oh, from uh, the University of Massachusetts actually trying to uh, look at the, the different species of sharks that are within the monument. And uh, we caught lemon sharks, nurse sharks, uh, Caribbean reef sharks, black tips, a few big tiger sharks, but we have yet to catch any hammerheads and confirm that they were present. So this, this video footage was really exciting for us to see. Oh, yeah, go ahead. There was like little fish following the, the tiger shark. What are they doing? Are so, they yeah, so the remoras will kind of hitch rides on at least the, some of those sharks. Um, I think some of the fish, I mean, I've seen fish like associate with sharks like that, but I've also seen them associate with turtles. So I think it's more of like an element of like maybe safety in a sense of hang out with something bigger than you. Mess with you. So the five days with the, where, uh, when you saw the sharks, you couldn't see any turtles? Surprisingly, actually, I did see some turtles. Um, I actually got one clip. Um, it's honestly pretty poor quality. But I didn't show it today. Where there's two turtles grazing, and the shark comes in, and both turtles just kind of back out of the footage. That shark swims through, and then they come right back around and start grazing again. So there, there were still turtles around, but not nearly as many as there was when there were no sharks. <laughs> So it was a little discouraging because that happened in the first week of my video deployments. And I was like, oh no, this might not work, actually. Yeah, have you seen any turtles missing appendages? Not in the video footage, but I know, I, I would imagine in the in water, you guys pull up every once in a while one with a thin Yeah, they're, they're pretty something. resilient. So you'll see them sometimes. We've got a couple um, juvenile turtles that come up that have um, undergone some kind of trauma to, to a limb. Uh, and then all the way up to nesting females come up with whole fins missing. And uh, we'll assist them with the, the nesting process. Usually they're a little um, clumsy, I guess. They don't have quite the same dexterity. Um, so they struggle with, with the nest hole cavity digging and that kind of thing. So we usually help them out. Um, but yeah, they, it's, it's common to see turtles that are missing part or even a whole fin sometimes. That must be a strong crop because you said that they were not affected by the hurricanes that came through. Yeah, so I say that in the sense that it was six weeks until I could get back out there and actually measure the growth and compare it to before the hurricane. So I think that was enough time for, usually what happens in a hurricane is um, some of the weaker grasses, the blades will just get broken off. They won't get uprooted, but broken off. Um, or sand displacement will vary the seagrass and then they can't get any light. Um, but what was interesting is I you know, measured the size of the meadow before and after and measured growth before and after and there was really no difference. Um, I think partly the Buck Island was fortunate to got, get hit nearly as hard as some other areas, um, so I do. So what's uh, interesting about the, the hurricanes, uh, Matt Kendall's prior work about 15 years ago now, yeah was actually suggesting that uh, hurricanes and disturbance like that might help with the dispersal. We were talking about um, seagrass pastures expanding. That might be one of the mechanisms that help do that. The, and that would be great under natural conditions. What we're seeing now is disturbance, our, our disturbance um, is often followed by these invasive species. So we have the invasive seagrass that comes in and is really able to rapidly take over those disturbed areas. 
and so uh, in that way you're kind of changing the natural system here. Yeah, that was one thing we did see is before the hurricanes, we knew the spots where the invasive was. After the hurricanes, it had definitely spread. And you would see floating fragments of it in the water column, which most other seagrass species usually aren't going to be able to settle that way. But Halophila gets uprooted so easily, so it just moves to another spot, plops down, and it can grow just about anywhere. Um, in really disturbed areas, um, in deep areas. Uh, it can grow in really cold water, really warm water. It's pretty it's really shallow. It's yeah. It's an incredible species. Yeah. And, uh, and it's almost designed for disturbance. Yeah. Where does, where does it originate from? What's that? Where does it originate from, the invasive uh, In India, I believe. Yeah, Mediterranean area yeah. and is, Indian Ocean. Is that a new phenomenon that is invasive, or has it been going on for a I think oh. if oh, Go ahead. <laughs> I think uh, it first got into the Caribbean. I want to say like early two thousands, um, and it's been mainly the Eastern Caribbean that it's really spread. Uh, like I think Guadeloupe has it really badly. Is Saint that Martin. A water temperature thing or nutrient thing? Or? Uh, I mean, it, it's just it's so good. Uh, uh, we, we think what happened oh, was it got moved over in like probably ballast water yeah. or something like that, and then once it established itself here, it was just able to outcompete everything else. It, it found a new place to grow and thrive. It really and likes open areas. But like, it'll, it'll pick yeah. up residents just about in any habitat. And so it's able to um, get into places where, you know, I was just talking about uh, the Glacia being a, a long lived species and, and taking a longer while to um, establish itself. And um, there's other edge species, and this just comes in and, and like creates monocultures, it just mm -hmm. takes over. Area, so. Yeah, there's been some really neat studies actually down in Bonaire. Um, the invasion started in Lac Bay, uh, I think it was 2010, and I was just there this past year. Um, and there's a researcher there that's looking at the, how the invasive is affecting the turtles. And that invasive is basically pushing the turtles into shallower water because they're following the native species. But it's pushing them so much into the mangroves that there's going to be a point where all there is is invasive, and the turtles, at least there, aren't wanting to eat it. Um, so the link there that I think was really interesting was you were talking about sea turtles were selecting certain blades and being very specific about their choice. And so there was some thought, and, and maybe it may still yet happen, that green turtles would adapt and they would start eating this um, invasive species. And we've seen some of that, but it seems to be more um, on accident, I would it's say. It's like that incidental, is, I right, think. That, they're I, trying I, to get a thalassia blade and they just end up with a mouthful. Of, they're not selecting for it. Yeah. It's not harmful. No. It's not necessarily harmful to, to them to digest or anything. Like yeah, it's not harmful. It's just low in nutrients compared to. Yeah. Yeah, like they. If you actually look at the blades, they're see through. They're, there's nothing much to them. So, I mean, a poor turtle would have to graze a huge amount in order to get any nutrition. Do you pull them up? The, the invasive? The halophila, yeah. yeah. Do you ever, because, I mean, there, there are programs where invasive um, plants are being removed in national parks on the mainland. Right, exactly. So there were some studies that were conducted over in St. John uh, where we were trying to quantify the, the effort uh, that would go into in the effectiveness of a removal like that. And it was incredibly um, labor intensive. Uh, and not very effective at all. In fact, the the process of trying to collect it and remove it seemed to just scatter it yeah. even more. You, you have to uh, really get in, and it's just so prolific uh, that they basically, I don't want to say gave up on the, on the concept, but it, it, the, the science showed that it was going to be a, a huge endeavor to try and stop it, and you're not really going to do it. Not I mean, gonna. even to pull up like an area that big, I mean, you're talking about thousands of shoots. But it's, I mean, you look at the last year, an area that big, there would maybe be 20. But this stuff is so dense, and they have um, what's called a horizontal rhizome. So it's basically one root that goes parallel to the sediment and shoots up all of these little sprouts. And so if you pull one up, it pulls the whole thing up, it breaks, and all these little pieces grow float away and they can settle yeah. elsewhere. So exactly yeah. what <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
Do we have any right. other questions? Otherwise, six thirty hour has approached. And, uh, I, but before we go, I just want to um, say thank you to Benito, our interpretive yeah. ranger. Yeah. Um, to just take a, a quick minute maybe talk about the ticket to ride program and how we're working with oh, okay. UF yeah. to get um, the, the kids involved yeah yeah so so um, so I just got a, I just got a collaboration with Dr. Thomas and Big Bears to take all the fifth graders all the public elementary schools uh, to bucket them for free gratis in the second year and we're going to step further by even um, raising the money to cover the taxi the shuttle get them from the schools to the, to the park. And for those that don't have school insurance, we're gonna cover the school insurance costs. So I met with the assistant commissioner, Ms. Encarnacion. She was elated because that's the first time that's ever happened. But it's, it's, it made a big impact, and we're getting the kids out to the park, that's for sure. So, yeah. So it's gonna happen between...